This presentation covers cash and receivables. Cash and cash equivalents. Cash is our most liquid asset, but we also include with it, if you look at your balance sheet, and this is always the one that's listed first for current assets, is you will see cash equivalents. These are short-term investments that are highly liquid and easily converted to cash. And the rule is the intention has to be that you're going to hold them for less than three months. And these used to be called trading securities. We also have cash that's called restricted cash. And depending on the requirements, it may be set aside for a specific purpose and will appear as a long-term investment on the balance sheet. So the portion that we categorize as restricted cash will not be part of cash and cash equivalents. Now, the other thing we talk about is bank overdrafts and GAAP and the international standard are different. Under GAAP, overdrafts can be offset against other accounts only if they're in the same bank. Otherwise, the overdraft would be treated as a current liability. Under the international standard, they allow you to offset any overdrafts against any account regardless of the bank. And if you're using the Spiceland book, you can see this on page 355. They have an example. Now, discounts. We have trade discounts which are ignored. And this is when someone will say, if you buy volume, you'll have to pay less. And of course, all you're going to record the sale at is the lower amount. Then we have sales discounts. These are given for early payment. The gross method. We record the gross sale and record the discount if taken as a debit to sales discounts. This is a contra sales account and will show up on the income statement following sales and would reduce sales. We also have the net sales method. We book the sale net of the discount and credit sales discount forfeited, which is an adjunct account to sales, which means that it's going to appear on the income statement and add to your sales when the discount is not taken. So now let's take a look at an example of both these methods. So under the growth method, we had a sale. We sold 5,000 and the terms were 3% if you pay in 10 days, but you have to pay the balance in 30. We would record the sale at 100%. And if they paid within terms, we would record a sales discount which is going to reduce our sales revenue when we put it on the income statement. And we take the whole accounts receivable off at 5,000 and the cash we receive would be the difference. Now, if they paid after the 10 days, it would be just cash and receivables. Now let's look at the same problem, but use the net method. When we record the sale, we're going to take off the sales discount of 150. So the accounts receivable and sales are only recorded at the 4850. Paid within terms. All you're going to do is record the cash and the accounts receivable. But what if they're paid after the 10 days? Then what you're going to do is record the sales discount forfeited of 150. You're going to increase the accounts receivable by 150, and then you're going to show the payment. Now we'll go to accounts receivable. We have two ways of treating uncollectible accounts because under GAAP, we need to show our receivables at net realizable value. So we have to take into consideration that not all of our clients are going to pay us. Now the two ways are the direct write-off method, now, this is not acceptable under GAAP, but required for tax. Write off the debt when the account is uncollectible. The write off of bad debt affects the income statement and the balance sheet at the point you write it off. Bad debt expense is the actual amount written off during the year. And then we have the allowance method. We have two of these. And both of these require that we set up a contra asset account called allowance for uncollectible accounts. The write-off of bad debt has no effect on the income statement or the balance sheet. 
it's when we estimate bad debt expense that the income statement and balance sheet is affected. Now here we have two methods. We have percentage of net credit sales, which is also known as the income statement method. And we have percentage of receivables, which is called the balance sheet method. These can be done two ways. One is we have just one rate and they take that percentage times the balance in our accounts receivable. Or what we can do is age our accounts receivable and use different percentages based on how old the receivables are under the assumption that the older the receivable, the less likely to collect the money. Now, one of the things that we need to talk about before we get started on going over those three methods is what happens if an account that's previously been written off, the client then pays us? Well, regardless of the method used, whether it's the direct write-off method or either of the allowance methods, what you must always do is first reestablish the accounts receivable and then show the payment. So we have J Grant paid 15,000 on accounts receivable written off in the previous year. So if we had been using the direct write-off method, we would set up the $15,000 accounts receivable, but we would credit bad debt expense. Then we would show the actual payment relieving the receivable. We do this because we like a trail. Now, if we were using the allowance method, again, we would still reestablish J Grant $15,000 receivable, but then instead we would credit allowance for uncollectibles. Then we record the cash and the accounts receivable. Now let's go through an example of the direct write-off method. We have a company, we're going to use the same problem for all three cases. Company A has $600,000 in accounts receivable at year end. During the year, they wrote off $21,000 in bad debt. What is the journal for the write-off, the bad debt, and what is bad debt expense? So, we're going to debit bad debt expense and credit accounts receivable because we've got to take the receivable off the books. And bad debt expense, when you use the direct write-off method, will equal total write-offs for the year. And in this example, it would be $21,000. Percentage of sales can be used during the year, but aging of receivables provides a more accurate estimate, so should be used at year end. Most companies use both methods, percentage of sales during the year, aging of receivables at the end of the quarter, and the end of the year. Bad debt expense equals credit sales times percentage. So now let's take a look at an example. We're going to use the same example, but of course we need to know what were the credit sales and what percentage are we going to use. So again, we have a company with $600,000 in accounts receivable. The allowance for uncollectible account had a beginning balance of $32,000 credit balance. During the year, they wrote off $21,000 in bad debt. They had credit sales of $3 million with bad debt estimated at 1%. Now, Here's the thing, when you're addressing a homework program, if they say allowance for uncollectibles has its normal balance and it's 32,000, or if they say the beginning balance is 32,000, you can assume it has a credit balance because that is its normal balance because it's a contra account to accounts receivable. So it appears on the balance sheet following accounts receivable. So what does it look like when we write off the bad debt? Well, we're going to debit allowance for uncollectibles, and we're going to credit accounts receivable. Now we're going to do our bad debt expense. We're going to do our estimate. So what we're going to do is bad debt expense is going to be 30000 Allowance for uncollectible is going to be 30000 so bad debt expense, remember, is always an estimate when you're doing the allowance method. Bad debt expense is going to equal the estimated bad debt expense of 30000 Ending balance, allowance for uncollectible. Beginning balance was 32. We had write-offs of 21, so that's going to reduce the account. We had an estimate based on sales of 30, which increases the account. 
And for now, we have a balance of 41,000. What are our net accounts receivable? It would be 600,000 minus 41, which would give us 559. Now let's look at aging of accounts receivable. When we age accounts receivable, one of the ways is that this can be done, and quite easily today because of computers, you just set this up. How do we determine these percentages right here? Well, it would be based on our history, or we could look at industry averages. So what we would do is we would look at all of our invoices that are zero to 30 days and we put the total from that and we're saying we're estimating that five percent of those would not be collected so we take 510,000 times five percent tells us our estimated allowance for bad debt is going to be 25,500 of that 510 and then we would go through again the older the receivable the less likely you collect so that's why when you get to over 120 days we're assuming 45 percent of it will not be collected what we then do is add up all those estimates and that 37,250 is what the balance in our allowance for uncollectible account should be at year end so now let's look at our same problem again and in this example, what they have to tell you is, and they told us that we are estimating it, that it's 37,250 based on the aging we just did. Another thing they can do is they will give you a percentage, which you would take times accounts receivable, and they will tell you in the problem it's based on accounts receivable. Then you know you're using the balance sheet method. So our write-off is the same. As it was for percentage of sales, it's going to go against allowance for uncollectibles, and we're going to take the receivable off the books. Now, estimating bad debt. In this case, the difference is that when they tell us the balance should be $37,250, what we need to do is look at the allowance for uncollectible account and figure out what amount do we have to credit the account for in order to get it to equal 37,250? So we would start with our beginning balance, subtract our write-offs, and then we're saying that the ending balance should be 32,250, which means that we're going to, the amount we have to estimate what we need to bring it to that balance, which is 21,250 which is the 32,250 minus the 32,000 that's already there plus the 21,000 that you um, took out. So that tells us that in order for us to get the ending balance of 32,250, we need to record bad debt expense of 21,250. So again, bad debt expense is the estimated bad debt, which is 41 